So in the statement, it gives you the information that the information that you have to convey is what you want to do, who are the audiences, and what is your vision. Do you have any conditions in visualizing uh, those possible solutions? So this is the statement that aggregates the core problems that you have identified. And then it opens up the ideation that you can do in the, in the, in the following session. So the exercise three, I will use where we have to go through this all together, so I will explain it at the same time as well. So after you come up with a few challenge statements, in the group, in group you have to think really carefully about what are those statements really resonate uh, with you within your groups. And then use those questions to spark conversation within your group. And then you can start generating ideas. So um, you still have a few um, statements of the issue cards on the table at each group. So you can use the issue card to write down your ideas. You can discuss with people or you want to do it on your own. Then you will have to share within the groups to uh, identify what are the ideas that you want to build up the times, uh, and you have to get a contract on that. So the cooperation will, we will use the idea, idea development sheet for this session, and the problems over here, you, you can take the problem statements that you already generated in the, in, the, in the morning. But in this stage, only select those ones that resonate with you. And, and those ones that you think is really important. They, they are the key issues that you have to address. And put them in the order with the priority. Then after that, you can think about value. So what, what values should we hold? Is there any conditions? We have to think carefully before we start generating solutions. And then you can put your challenge statements over here because it's the, the inspiration for you to think about what the possible, possible solutions can be. And as you also mapped out some of the solutions uh, ideas this morning, but those ideas that we mapped out in the morning are generally uh, general ideas. And in this stage, you have to be solid enough to be able to communicate how you are going to deliver this solution. Be more specific. And so we can have a, a more deliverable solution. Also, think about resources. Who are able to uh, provide money and who are the people that can help you develop this idea? Or is there any uh, existing program? And so on. Then take some time to reflect those ideas. Is there any risk? If yes, then put it down and think about if you have any solution to, to respond to that risk. And if yes, I think that will be a very good idea that we can keep working on. So, after that, you put who can, can deliver this idea. And each of the information, you need to have a link between you. So this problem is actually addressing these problems. Uh, this idea is responding to these problems. And this is the resource for this idea. There is a risk, but we have solution to that. And these three people can, or these three organizations can deliver this. Um, idea to respond to that problem. And then you can think about um, like how will you measure the success and how could we review the service and quality in the future. So we just see these are the questions that give you more, um, more time and the space to reflect on to, to generate a path, better policy and service ideas. So we we will have um, 
I think, two, less than two hours to work on this. So um, I will check with all of the groups after one hour and see how you are. And if you have any questions, please, please um, let me know in time. Is there any questions for now? Okay. So I'll hand it over to the facilitators in each group. And yeah, that's pretty on it. Thank you.
then there's a list of different apps. Oh, we can have ideas. Like, you know, send this. And then they have a way to do it. And then they have a way to do it. And then they have a way to do it. And then they have a way to do it. And then they have a way to do it.
understanding structuring how governments as a
we, we talked about are um, who has access to credentials, uh, which is varying degrees for some of the possible solutions we, we presented. Um, the idea of regulatory capture. We have a agency that's that's regulating a private company that has maybe more power than the government agency that's regulating it. Then you have an issue of regulatory capture. Um, costs, some of the solutions that are you know, taxes, uh, but we also thought about are there ways that we can communicate how doing some of these things would reduce the hidden costs um, so we can report on the benefits of doing some of these things as a way to help justify the cost of doing them. And then I'm, I'm not sure if I'm running out of time or how close we are. You still have three minutes left. Okay, three minutes. Um, I think, uh, yeah, okay, so we're good on time. So the response to the lobby is, you know, was we definitely thought about the local government and the federal government and which way is appropriate for which of these solutions. Um, involving tech firms, city of tech, that's interesting. Yes, I'm not going to go into all of those. Um, but our sort of vision for, for success is public understanding of their, their rights around data, um, increased trust and confidence in between government and residents, and um, um, yes, and private public partnership, and yeah, and adoption of the bill of rights. Um, yeah. So, any other any any big ideas that I'm, I'm missing in here, or things that you wanted to highlight?
that's what they currently have. And we extracted other problems related to that, such as um, clean, accurate data set posted. So, so the need for a clean, accurate data set posted on the state's open data portal. Um, another problem is just the general usability and discoverability by residents. And um, the verifiability or accuracy of that information. No way to find out if that data is trustworthy or accurate. Um, so the values that we hold are accuracy, we want to make sure that, that the data can be easily used, and I'm not sure what was timely again. Published timely. That is published timely. What's that? So it's not data. Oh, that it's updated regularly. Yeah. It can be accessed in a timely manner. Or can be accessed in a timely manner. Um, so our challenge statement was, how might we enable renters to quickly find rent regulated apartments um, and their eligibility for them? Or enable renters to find, I don't know, I think we just settled on this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a couple of the possible solutions that we came up with was um, a task force to liberate or structure the city relevant data owned by the state. So basically like a, um, someone to play the middle man part to make sure that um, the data that the city has is structured in a way that is usable for residents. <clears throat> Um, and then a risk and barrier to that is that that is highly politicized. Um, another possible solution is training tools to help the PDF maker issue data in a usable format. Um, another possible solution is like a rent bot, which is a, a chat bot that can tell me whether the apartment, an apartment is rent controlled or whether I am eligible. Uh, the risk and barrier for that is privacy. Um, what did we say specifically about? Just making sure that we take that into account. Could you be getting a lot of personal information? Right, just making sure that it's it's not giving more information than the user wants to divulge. Um, and then also another solution is a map or tool to display the location. And that would be obviously a tech person or resources to support that. Um, and then the resources that we would need for any of these solutions are, um, I think this is related yeah. For the task force, it's money, obviously, and then uh, United Buy and Alliance between the city and the state because there's some, um, they're not completely on the same page. Um, and then for uh, training tools to help the uh, make the data that's in the PDF into a more usable format, we need, like, for example, Data NYC's Open Data Portal, um, or there's also um, a uh, website called MI Rent Stabilize, so I think using those things together, you would get at that solution. Um, and then to be able to create this rent bot, the chat bot, you would use the, there is actually an existing PDF of listings um, on the state website. Um, further solutions for risks and barriers are the therapy between government and mayor. <laughs> uh, community driven verification. Um, this is something And an open, I think a citizen public campaign advocacy for uh, open data standards. Uh, some of the responsible bodies that we've identified are the Housing and Preservation Department, Rent Guidelines Board, basically these are all the organizations that have, that have this information, just not in a useful format. Uh, Renters Associations to represent uh, renters and residents, uh, housing and advocacy groups, uh, sites like Street Easy, real estate, other real estate sites, and New York State 
homes and community renewal. Um, for the stakeholder map, the core is uh, for, on the city side is the state-led government, and then um, obviously New York City renters. They're sort of the um, the subject, I guess, of this problem or issue, and then um, directly the, the next circle would be NYC landlords and civic tech devs who would be the ones creating these tools and trying to figure out how to make the um, data more usable and use that for these tools, and um, indirectly private companies like Palantir that collect data. Um, government agencies, um, philanthropists, and um, homeless people. Do you want to add something to the book? I mean, I think those were, those were some of the potential stakeholders that we mapped out as like people to take into account during the process. So they're not necessarily contributing directly to the process, but are, you know, good and bad and otherwise uh, consequential people who may be affected by these decisions or who could affect the way that the process goes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I work for NRG Digital and we are specifically on phase two of a housing affordable project focusing on affordable housing in New York and it's a huge problem. I would love to invite anyone from your team and anyone here to join our cross-agency task force. Uh, we work with, uh, at this point, seven other agencies, including NYCHA and HPD, and we work with the Department of Finance uh, to figure out how to work with the financial empowerment managers when they talk to New York City residents about affordable housing. So all the solutions I would love for you to present them at our next meeting, and uh, we can tell you what data is available and how we can uh, figure out how to incorporate all of that into the next phase of the housing portal. Anyone here, and if you want my phone number or email, you can give me your cards, and I promise you I'll email you tomorrow, or I will give you all of my information right after this. Thank you. Thanks for the second group, and now it's the time for the third group. Please present. I actually have a comment just following up with that. There, I don't know if you mentioned it, but you know the website called mmrightstabilize.com? Yeah. Okay, they did that. They did that to file a FOIL request and kind of lost through the process of checking whether your building is still. Okay, so um, I'll present the first half of our process, but as you can see, there's a little bit of gap of uh, post-its here, mostly because we actually turned into a really interesting discussion about the meta structure of um, the process itself. Um, so we'll kind of have a two-part presentation. Really quickly, um, the core problems we talked about were a paper of bureaucratic processes for data. Um, I don't know if data is accessible or aggregated by myself or by others. A high percentage of the population is unreachable, or it's unclear how I benefit from my government, from the government having better access to my data. Um, so essentially, the two challenge statements we consolidated from these core problems were: how might we help residents understand the data that the city possesses and how it's used and how it's biased, um, and how might how might we help communities to access, use, or create data for public good. Um, and the possible solutions we came up were mostly trying to. Um, okay. There, one of them was a consistent metadata standard and notification protocol that alerts and notifies people of eligible programs or services. So, kind of tying to the first one or a chatbot, it would be like, hi, oh, your apartment is rent controlled. Looks like you might not know. Or, hi, oh, you might be eligible for free health care. You're like in a demographic that may be eligible for free health care, just so you know, or some way to better connect. Um, uh, people with uh, services. Um, we talked about using open source CCAN, community knowledge something network, software, uh, like a data repo, 
Um, and generally, most of our discussions in this early phase of our process were around having a very easy to navigate hacker websites for the public because um, most of our solutions hinged around uh, not so much like having open, open data portals, but the gap between knowing what's data out there and how, how uh, what is a good and helpful user experience. So like sites like environmentcivilized.com, or maybe having a facilitator and software development team to do neighborhood outreach. So that's kind of what we were going through, and in the process, actually turned into a really interesting discussion around like the general structure of uh, the development sheet and like what it optimizes for. So we can talk about that. Um, so I think uh, we started talking about the design of this model itself because we found ourselves. Experience, ourselves experiencing this kind of struggle going even through the first phase uh, and I think uh, it all became more clearly once we were asked to okay now that you have all these uh, issue statements how do you prioritize them and the, the first thought was okay why don't we just say what's more important to us but then we kind of took a step back and say, no, wait, what's this process for? This is to then open to the public for more ideas and for their feedback. So which of these issue statements is actually something that we already know the answer and we just need to get better at it? And which ones we don't know the answer and, or the answer that we know needs uh, the other feedback loop of if, is this a good idea? Is, are we are actually addressing the problems that are harming you, etc.? So for example, when we said like, help residents understand what data this, the city has about them, it's like, do, do we know what data is collected by every agency, every department, every service, how that service is using it? We don't, probably. I don't know, because we're not those. Then we don't, like, we, so that's the first problem, and that's the problem that, in a way, we need to solve internally first. And how are we going to do that? It's going to be a completely different process of ideation that then imagine that we did have that data and we did act, we actually know, then how do we open it to the community? And also raise some questions like who's overrepresented by this data? Who's underrepresented by this data? How are we using this data to solve problems more effectively? So that's how kind of the feedback loops that we started to struggle with that brought us kind of uh, back and forth on rethinking the model itself and saying how can we optimize this uh, experience. Uh, and it is our understanding that this is for public officials first. So why instead of asking public officials to already start thinking about possible solutions, reframe every area into Problem definition. What are the solutions you're trying so far? Uh, what are the resources that you have uh, so far available for this problem? Like, what's the open data related to the problem? What are the constraints in terms of budget, in terms of jurisdiction, in terms of law, etc.? Uh, and in that way, when you get this to the community, you are not guiding them already to the possible solutions that you already drafted for them and then give them more open and more create, space for creativity for the, for the community to, to suggest different solutions instead of guiding them. And that, that's like when we start to, okay, that would optimize for new ideas, problem solving. But this model can also be very useful. What if it's about optimizing for consensus? And then actually the public officials are able to say, this is something that we don't have an answer, these are, these are the possible solutions out there, we are not arriving to consensus because of uh, these risks and barriers, let's open it to the community to see if there's more possible solutions, and then what we need to do and what we need to optimize for is consensus, and how would we do that? So it was just more of a conversation about the tweaks of the model, what what can, how can it be used differently um, depending on the ultimate goal that you want to get to? And that's uh, the result of this team's work.
show this video now, so I don't know if that's going to happen or not, so I could do it, but I don't know if it's uh, She disappeared. She has to die to show this video. But, uh, How long is the video? It's uh, nine minutes. Nine minutes. Can you type
just about the most expensive. Ah, okay. Let me do that. So I just, I just, I just set it up. So I'm going to take it down. Okay. Okay. Yeah, she said you need to set it up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, just an interruption. Um, I work for the Internet Society. Um, you know, which is kind of responsible for the internet. And you know, the history of the internet was a, was a Department of Defense experiment. You know, which grew and then became a research thing. It was run by the National Science Foundation until about '92 when. So you know, it became it became commercial and the National Science Foundation went to let go, they let go of the backbone over to NCI and so on. And basically the whole thing was run by a mailing list called the IE, Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF. And uh, the Internet Society was formed as, as basically an organization of uh, back, you know, backing for the IETF so that they could have meetings and uh, that in 92. And at the same time in 92, they actually, um, uh, the idea, uh, this guy Dave Clark wrote a code, which uh, you can see here, uh, an aphorism. We reject King's president's voting. We believe in rough consensus and run code. And that is the, uh, the model of the IATF. And uh, that was in 92. This one, you know, to the system is they do request for comment and then for comment on. Um, and uh, this is RFC 7282 from 2014. So how they make consensus in the IETF is that uh, they hum. So they don't vote, but they hum. And everybody, the more people hum, the more you know they know whether something's good and the people groan or something. You know, so that's basically the way it works. So in the 2000s, this was known as the internet model, you know, multi-stakeholderism. And, uh, and it's only sort of more recently that we've come to appreciate that this isn't really the internet model, but it's multi-stakeholderism. And a prime example of this where it really came into the thing was the actual control of the, of the root of the internet, the what's known as the ARM function, um, and uh, which was you know was controlled by the American government, and so after Snowden, America was trying to make good with the world, and so they said, okay, we're going to hand the route over to the uh, internet community if you have a multi-stakeholder process involving everybody and no government yet to control the route of the internet, of the domain name system. So they had this thing, and eventually it did happen. Ted Cruz tried to stop it and didn't manage, and even just. Two weeks ago, they issued a notice of information where they're trying to see if they can take it back, but they can't. And the guy who handled this was a guy called Larry Strickling, who was the Under Secretary of State for the Department of Commerce, and uh, he saw it all through, and so he got fired when Trump came in. So we brought him to work for the Internet Society, and he's now running something called the Collaborative Governance Project for the Internet Society, and basically he goes out and preaches multi stakeholderism. He's looking for techniques. I write to him and say, look at this Taiwan thing. I have written to him more than once, and he's beginning to think about it. Um, but he made a speech last week, which was just a call to action for multi stakeholderism, which is this short video. If I can find my mouse. Anybody can see my mouse on that? Oh, this is the one. There it is. Uh, I can get to there and switch on audio here. And find the go button. Deliver a call of action to each and every one of you. A call of action that each of you commit to get personally involved in a multi-stakeholder effort to address key internet policy issues, to find consensus approaches to dealing with the issues, and to implement those solutions. Now, is that too much to ask at 9 o'clock this morning? I still don't think it is. But, but to do this, you're going to need some help. And I'm going to provide some help right now to those of you perplexed and confused by the multi-stakeholder process. First, 
We need a shared understanding of what is the multi-stakeholder process, and we need a shared understanding of what it is not. Now, there is no single model of the multi-stakeholder process, but for purposes of this discussion, let's focus on the key attributes that define an authentic multi-stakeholder process. One, it must be stakeholder-driven in that stakeholders determine the process and scope and direction of work. Two, it must be open and inclusive, both in terms of allowing broad participation and in ensuring that all issues are addressed. Three, the process must be transparent and accountable to all stakeholders and to the public. And four, outcomes must be consensus-based, delivering positive value to the greatest number of stakeholders. Now, a multi-stakeholder process that exhibits all of these attributes is most likely to be one that will be accepted as legitimate by the stakeholders and the public. Just as important as what is a multi-stakeholder process is understanding what it is not. And one, it is not an ism. The multi-stakeholder process is simply a set of tools to help people collaborate to solve problems. It is not a philosophy or a political ideology, and we do the process a disservice to refer to it as it isn't, because it encourages people to argue about it. It takes sides about what should be a set of tools that can provide and help everyone. Secondly, beware of those who haphazardly or even manipulatively attach the label only stakeholder to what in fact are multilateral or top-down processes. When a government or a business runs a consultation that is open to input from all stakeholders, but keeps the decision making to itself, it in no way is running a true multi-stakeholder process. And we find that rarely do such efforts even allow for collaboration among the stakeholders, much less decision making by them. So having described what is a multi-stakeholder process and what it is not, let me turn to my second point, which is that people are reluctant or afraid to take the initiative to establish multi-stakeholder processes. Part of that fear stems from people not knowing how to organize and manage a multi-stakeholder process. And that can be easily overcome. The Internet Society's Collaborative Governance Initiative is developing training materials on how to run multi-stakeholder processes. And there are already lots of instructional materials available. We in the Internet community may like to think that the multi-stakeholder process was born with the Internet, but that's simply not the case. Collaboration and consensus building techniques have been around for decades, and there are many instructional guides and manuals available worldwide to anyone who needs some help. But trust me when I tell you that the, of the keys to successful multi-stakeholder process, they mostly reflect simple common sense and basic stakeholder management principles. It's not rocket science, and it is easy to learn. Another part of the fear and reluctance to bring forward multi-stakeholder processes stems from the sense that the problems today are so large that we, um, protecting privacy, battling cybersecurity threats and the like, these are so large that people are intimidated about trying to organize a response. Also, there's a predisposition to want comprehensive and forcible solutions to these problems which usually translates into waiting for government or some other organization to take the initiative. I urge you not to let that fear deter you from taking action. The existing government processes to enact comprehensive legislation or write regulations or negotiate treaties are not well equipped to deal with the fast changing issues of the internet. These processes are slow. They usually don't result in any outcome. And even when they do, the problem that they intended to address often no longer exists. And if they get it wrong, it's incredibly difficult to undo bad legislation or regulation. Instead, I encourage each of you to think about how to address internet policy challenges in smaller bits. Can you define a piece of the issue in a way that a group of stakeholders in your own country or region um, could address the topic, find a consensus solution, and then have stakeholders implement it. 
We need to encourage experimentation around the world. We need to encourage finding ways to make incremental progress on issues by solving parts of the problem and then building on the small successes through iterations of the process over time. You will need to be creative. You will have to focus on elements of these issues whose solutions are within the power of the participating stakeholders to implement. And let me say that implementation is key. Too often participants in multi-stakeholder processes claim success when they reach consensus on the solution. But then they fail to address who's going to implement the solution and how it will be implemented. You must focus right from the start to define the problem to be solved in a way that allows the parties to the process to implement any consensus outcome. As an example of what I mean, take the issue of disinformation or fake news online. Some of the responses being discussed involve creating comprehensive regulatory frameworks for deciding what is disinformation and what to do about it. Absent a government convening the multi-stakeholder process to create such a framework, there is little use to having you organize your own process to develop such a scheme. You have no authority or ability to implement the framework, and because of that fact, you would have a hard time sustaining such a discussion for any length of time. But that doesn't mean it's an issue you should stay away from. You can make a contribution to solving the problem. What if you convene the multi-stakeholder process to develop and implement an educational program on media literacy? You could certainly identify a set of stakeholders who would have the ability and incentive to design and deliver such a program. Now, none of you can do this by yourself. You need to work together with others in your community. You need to recruit stakeholders who will represent all of the key views that have to be addressed. But it takes a catalyst. Someone who steps forward and takes that lead to initiate the discussion. And each and every one of you can play that role of, as a catalyst. No matter how narrow the issue you take up or how limited the geographical extent of the discussion, every successful multi-stakeholder decision that is implemented provides input into new norms for answering the challenges before us. Over time, they will combine and compound into broad solutions, and if and when, governments decide to legislate a comprehensive, enforceable approach, they will be guided by the aggregation of these individual solutions. Commentators refer to the internet as having allowed permissionless, permissionless, permissionless innovation. The idea that allowing experimentation with new technologies without requiring government or competitor approval. What I'm urging all of you today is to engage in permissionless problem solving. If we all make it our responsibility, perhaps we can spur the next great leap forward for the internet to better recognize and respect human rights, to better deter cybercrime and cyber attacks, and to better meet the needs of citizens around the world. And all I ask is that you give it a try. So please do it, and I thank you for listening to me this morning. Okay. Yeah, I come before you. Huh? Okay, I've lost my mouse. Can you, can you paste the link in the bottom slack? Okay. Thank you. No, I've lost my mouse. Okay, just a minute. Oh, it's on the top of the video. It's on top of the video. It's in the notes. Okay. Now it's in the URL, now it's in the green, now it's back to the video, now it's at the top. Okay, you got it? Yeah. Okay.
demonstrate today was actually um, the the preparation, like how can we turn the preparation into the material that we use during the preparation. We didn't uh, actually stimulate the part how people uh, uh, deliberate on those uh, materials that we prepared because it requires like two or three weeks time to get a chance to synthesize all the information, reflect and critique on that, then present it back to the wider stakeholders and then they can add extra comments on that. So, um, and also lots of people might be uh, confused about the first exercise, so I will explain a little bit more about um, why we're doing that uh, for the first exercise. So the exercise one is actually the training part of the whole process, like empowering the senior servants to be able to be equipped to tackle diverse um, statements from any kind of source. So that's a training session for them, and then after the training session, the outcome will be aggregated, being synthesized, and on this on this big campus. So this is actually the working document for the civil servants. They need to put all of the statements in a structured way to make sure that um, this includes all of the uh, problem descriptions, uncertainties. Uh, existing so solutions. So they will map how all of the statements over here and also provide the evidence. So we make sure that um, the, if we have any question to those statements, we have someone to refer to. And then the, third, the third, uh, second part of this document is um, identifying stakeholders, which you all did um, this morning. And this allows us to understand who uh, make that uh, statement and also it allows us to understand and think about who are missing during the whole the whole process. And the third part is the principal part because as, as the first group mentioned that there are some uh, existing uh, the existing solutions from the government that we should understand beforehand. So this, this is actually the part that we ask the senior service to fill in what are their current uh, plans that respond to all of the uh, problems on the left hand side. So we get an idea of what's out there and then we also push them to think what they can do uh, more. Because when, the, when we ask them to provide what they've already been doing, we also ask them about their difficulties if they already did a good job, then people would not uh, raise the petition or the problem. So there must be something wrong uh, with what they're already doing. And we need to know why it's not working. So we also ask their point of view of how, of what they think is not working. And if it's not working, then what would be the best way to, to make it better? So we also uh, do the during the preparation part within the government across different ministries, we also ask them to think future plans and what are the possible resources they can use. So when we all have those information before the actual deliberation um, during the cooperation workshop, everyone can get a good idea of what's going on and what we can build upon that. So this is something that we didn't do today and if we actually have this big plan before the deliberation, I think um, things will go more smoothly um, I'll, I'll do the exercise one. And so after that, uh, I showed you the, I mentioned you the real time work here. So in the actual preparation stage, uh, we will finish this big canvas of uh, the whole picture research and then turn that into a mind mapping, uh, a mind mapping uh, diagram that we show this in the beginning of the vibration. So when people uh, 
come and see those information, they can actually add their comments on it. So we don't actually give people post-it. People can write on post-it, but they can also talk about it. And we have um, our colleagues writing the comments on the digital version of the post-it real time when somebody talk about something. So everything is being uh, documented real time and being criticized at the same time. So people don't just talk about things come from nowhere. They actually have a structured uh, information that can discuss by different order. And they can also, um, this prevent them to talk about the same thing uh, again and again. And this will force the um, conversation to be a more solid situation. So this is the part that we didn't demonstrate and let you uh, practice either. And so during the integration and cooperation part, we will actually present this from uh, people, uh, the, the secret servers from different ministries will do the presentation based on the structure. So people can understand the mind mapping better because not everyone is familiar with this, but they can listen to the slides from the representatives from the new ministry. So usually the deliberation starts from 10 o'clock and finishes at 3 o'clock. So 10 o'clock we will welcome everybody to talk about the process of the workshop that the civil servants will talk about the slides based on the line mapping structure. Then we open um, discussion from all of the people. So we will have everyone looking at the line mapping board and starting talking about the, the problems that is not addressed on, on this map. Then we will have a very good view of what everyone thinking about until uh, around 11.30. Then we will start uh, synthesizing all the information and generate challenge questions like what we did today. So during the launch time, we will have a few how many week questions, and then in the afternoon from 1.30 to 3 o'clock, they will have time to do the cooperation, like what we did this afternoon. So what happened after that? These are all initial ideas and possible solutions. But it's also important to reflect again and again, does this really work? So after the, after the cooperation session, um, our colleagues who also participate in the, the workshop will generate this document uh, for, for civil service, for policymakers to understand what people were discussing about. And yeah, questions? Oh, uh, just about the um, categories of the comments. It took our group a little while to figure out what categories to use, and I noticed like that they were similar but different to the other groups. Um, and so, at one of these meetings, is that too late to recategorize? Yeah. Issues or are things moving around and these categories being added and removed? Or? Yeah, so uh, during the preparation stage, uh, within the government, they, there's a lot of debates on how to categorize those things. So we originally uh, built a consensus of what the category can be among different stakeholders within the government. So usually when it comes to the deliberation part, it's already been polished and people generally agree on that. But sometimes they will add some categories that the citizens haven't have think about. Mm -hmm. So it's really good to have the deliberation that to to have the deliberation that allows people to add more comments on that. But usually we don't we we rarely change the category because it's been polished again again and be deliberated with the government for a few times. So speaking of the policy canvas, it allows the policymakers to to make sure um, that the process during the cooperation workshop is actually being able to connect to the actual policy making process. So. And, but this is not 
still not enough. Like when when we want to reach the the uh, deliver stage, like what I mentioned earlier about the double diamond process. The box, the policy canvas is probably something around here. And we need to make sure that uh, we have a good understanding of how we can do for that better. Because there are all those points that what can be done in the future, but how can we do that and how do we measure the impact and how do we make sure that people can really uh, benefit from from, from all of the solutions, or can these really respond to people's uh, problem? We need to carefully think about that during this process. So it will usually uh, involve some new things and editing different words, and also include the comments from the from my staff. So they usually give a really good view of how this, these things can can work. So, and when everything is being um, identified and being made sure, I think that's the, the point where we can deliver that. But the process doesn't usually end over there. We expect people to be able to keep irritating the process even when the project is delivered. But it's really difficult within the, within the process. So yeah, I will wrap up over here, and now is the time for open discussion. So if you have any thoughts and any feedback, just feel free to, to let us know, because the, we actually, the idea, idea the government achieved, we, we um, iterate the model every month, and this has just been finished a few, a few days ago. So we keep updating our process based on the experience from the participants. We interview any kind of stakeholders after the workshop and, and understand what we can do better and what we are good at doing. So it keeps the model um, growing and we want to optimize this model. Um, just keep it, it, uh, iterating and trying new things and we feel we learn. So we, we want to keep improving. So today we also would like your feedback as well. And so during this uh, session, me and Patricia and uh, Shuya and Tiffany and Audrey will take questions from, from everyone. So who wants to go next? Hi, uh, this is very long. Uh, my question is about uh, prototyping and how you present some of your policy or design ideas beyond text to the next level of fidelity. So for example, on these sheets, like, you have a space for like pictures and images, but there's, and you use this design double diamond um, process here. So I'm just wondering, are there ways where you sort of present design prototypes, either for tools or like policy drafts um, for people for comment as to, like what happens after this process? So um, in regards to the, the online test system that I presented earlier, it, it, it's varied from, from projects because that one is mainly about how we can improve the, the public service, not, not necessarily responding to uh, policy change. So, um, in regards to that project, we develop uh, the prototype uh, based on how we create a digital service. So Shuya was also part of the facilitator and coordinator of developing the tools that allows different participants from different backgrounds being able to do the prototype. So we designed the prototype tools specifically for that. Project. It depends on the project. Depends on the project. Any questions? Sure. About the... I cannot tell anymore, but about the, the rapid um, testing, like, do you actually do... 
like like how like how real is this testing? Like do you create pilots and then create proof of concept and then replicate and scale or is it just in paper doing one session? So there is only one um, I think how many projects have we done pilots with the text on my text this is Um, so it's easier with digital services like the textile system and the Medicare system, the CDC system, right? Uh, there's like three or so that we did uh, pilots, but um, it is about urban development or rural development or whatever. Um, we, we only did like mobile or simulations. It's, it's not a real, like a full technographic um, project. We haven't done that yet. I think that's the, the very critical thing because um, there is no, su no such imagination within the government yet about prototype policy. Like, and that's something that I would like to work more in the future, to be honest. Because I think there's, there's still no, no work for this. So, for example, um, the policy canvas that I showed earlier from from the, the pumping project. And I didn't actually involve the, the policy making process after that because we do have, um, we have to take all topics, different topics um, every month and we at least have two projects to work on. So usually when I finish the ideation stage and have seen how it's been uh, translated into the policy campus, then I will move on to another project. So I also would like to know more about how actually civil servants take this further. So this question can refer to Harshisha, and because I'm also curious to know how they actually act on this campus um, action. So how does the, um, the, the Council of Agriculture take this uh, policy campus uh, forward in the in the in the real practice. Sorry. How does the uh, the Council of Agriculture take this further? Like after we do after we done the cooperation project, Billy the colleague Yu Tang has been transferred all of the uh, outcomes into a, a format that is is more uh, more friendly to the policymakers. Mm -hmm. And so how, how do the policy making process be being done after this translation? Mm, I remember that um, after this collaborative meeting, uh, they did that uh, some homework we uh, the many uh, ministry take home. And uh, the part of the uh, our fishery agencies is to do some research on this issue. So now in lawmakers, um, we have no, no any further, but uh, we keep concerned on this issue. And uh, the main homework led to the Ministry of Interior, the marine, uh, the marine National Park headquarters. They have to uh, communicate communicate with the fishery community and uh, uh, dining lovers. You know, yeah. I just remember that. So, um, because the many issues that uh, we were discussing about, so I didn't I didn't touch too much about the content of what we actually discussed on, on that project. But the main issue that uh, has been raised during the workshop was um, like, should we, should we limit the amount of the visual industry? Um, and also like the tools that they use to, to, to capture those, those fishes, do, do we need to make it even more harder for them? And so, but, but in order to make that decision,
country and we need to research a little bit more on the environment perspective. And there is a limitation of the documentation and the research around that. Like, should we really protect that area? Um, um, the sea area over there? Nobody can really answer that question. That's why their next action is to do to outsource the research to the, the company. So th that is not something that can be prototyped, but they can actually have an action after that. And that's, that is one of the problem, um, the, the solutions that we cannot do in the workshop. So that has been turned into an action. But in regards to some of the, the other policies, I think there is still room for them to do some tests. So for example, um, what if they really restrict the behavior that uh, if they really restrict the fishery industry, then how, how can those people um, survive? Because they, they might lose their job or they will, they, they will not have enough income. So probably we need to find something that compensates that. And, and how can we do that? We actually have to prototype that. But I still didn't, I, I didn't see that happen. But I think that's something that we can work on a little bit more. Before it's been launched, like the government can say, oh, this is a great idea and we should do that. But what if, what if fishermen doesn't want that? What, what if fishermen doesn't want to be compensated in that way? I think that's something that we can prototype on and we have to work more on that. Um, so, for when your projects become a policy, um, who or which agency or department is writing that policy? Is it a co-design or co-writing process with the public? And before it becomes an official policy, does the public get to review it one more time to give their comments? And is there any iterative process? So during the cooperation process, it's actually the, the opportunity that allow there's an opportunity to that different stakeholders to write a policy together, and after that, there's um, the the people from the civil, uh, from the civil service. They will translate the outcomes into the policy terms, and they get a chance to review if it's going to. Uh, being implemented, take, take further or not. But that's also the critical part because sometimes the participants, not all of the participants get a chance to be involved in that decision-making process. But sometimes they do invite them to come to the meeting, so it's very from different ministries. So given that we have some participation officers here, I'm really, really curious. Um, this is a little bit more of a intangible question, but um, not so much the specific policy changes, but how have their own perceptions of public participation and of the public uh, shifted, say, in the last you know, six years since you have been doing all of this? Would somebody be open to speaking to that? I think uh, Patricia actually had a slide to talk about her experience working as a PO and what she learned and what, can, what, what the challenges are. So I think she can touch on that question later on. Uh, one idea that came up in our group was uh, just the difficulty, I think that already said it, but putting things into categories and when you mentioned like feedback, um, I was interested in what a tagging or like we started to think about what a tagging system might look like because so many issues seem to cross categories and especially if you're working in um, a digital space, is there some other way to like spatialize issues so that they're not so strictly bucketed? Um, so I thought it'd be interesting. Yeah. We do we do sometimes face the the period that we cannot really categorize some of the some of the the statements. 
And usually they are pre they are pre called like uncertainties. So we will categorize them in another in another category and say that they are uncategorized. But usually usually we want to categorize them as um, as much as possible because it's it gives us a sense because there are so many when we are facing a really critical topic. We all, we get a, we, we usually get lots of problem statements. And the calibre allows us to discuss the issue um, in particular order. So people don't talk about things. Like, oh, I talk about privacy, and then the, 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 uh, the next person will talk about oh, how can we make uh, data, like how can we best utilize data. And then the conversation will go nowhere. So that's, that's why we want to categorize things. But in, in regards to how we do that, we usually, um, it's, there's no certain methodologies to do that. It's just a lot, lots of time of reflecting, criticizing, and really trying to make sense um, of how we organize those data. So usually just take time to really understand the whole picture. And then finally we can have this category. Because sometimes um, problems say if if they are say there are three people want to address uh, one particular problem, you, um, people can address that in different ways. So also that's also part of the process to try on try to understand what people are really talking about, and then by doing that we can de reduce the statements because we we understand the situation and we try to. Uh, use the statement that can contain most of the thoughts. Um, in terms of the, the model itself, um, you doing pilots and testing the impact of the model. Like, I, I understand that there's like a common structure or architecture and then based on the needs and the problem itself, you make a lot of decision choices, uh, design choices out of it. Like, oh, for this, we do a pilot. For this, we go to the communities. For this, we, uh, are you documenting the, why are you making these design choices? And is, are you, in a way, measuring impact as to this has been more successful? That's a really good question. Both things are um, the things that I'm currently doing. So I'm writing a, a paper about um, the things that we've, we've been doing for the past two years and try to document the process. And also in the paper, I will be really critical about what we're doing and what things can be improved because there's, there's still a gap between the ideal process and what we can do due to the uh, restrictions within the government. So yeah, I, I'm happy to share with you the paper once once I finish. And the second question um, is about measuring measuring impact. Yeah, like is there some maybe testing or um... yeah. So so how we do do the um, the testing is actually today is also uh, a part of our testing as well. And we use the following workshops to test. Um, our approaches. So uh, we we have 36 collaborative workshops so far, and every workshop is slightly different because we learn something from the previous workshop, and we test something at the next workshop, and we do document those things using the mind mapping. It's, it's a mess, <laughs> and we still we still um, synthesizing all the information that we aggregated. We did lots of interviews, so we keep all of the transcripts in our document. And we are still at the stage of analyzing um, people's feedback. And if there is something that is actionable, we put it into the next uh, workshop. And then we test it. And then we move. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about how you debrief with the team after one of these sessions? Do you have like structured notes? You know, do you have a structured process right now? You do a debrief, like what do you do it for two hours the next day? Or 
how do you, how do you, yeah, so how do you factor in the, the feedback you get? How do you debrief with like the core team that does that facilitation? Okay. But within the core team, we do have a, a, a document that has a list of what we have to do uh, before the workshop and during the workshop. So we have a, um, a document for internal uh, colleagues to understand the process. But it's, it's not, it's, it's written in that room, so I cannot show you. <laughs> And then after the process, do you take, do you ask a certain set of questions that you evaluate yourself, that you evaluate the process by? You know, yeah. you take those notes, do you have like a, something you could call it like a hot wash, like where you try to get people to express their frustrations with the process from within the, the core team? Yeah, so um, if sometimes we um, have internal meetings after the cooperation workshop just to get everyone, core team's idea about what they have been experienced and what can be improved and we document all of the, the discussions. Does that answer your question? Sure. You just have all these nice templates. I was wondering if you had like a, like a worksheet for that. Oh, yeah. we, we do. There are two ways of documenting. Um, for one way is uh, just to Google Doc that we we write down what we've been discussed and we put that into format. So actually, there are a few discussions that we have are like have they are so informative. So we actually put it in this way, like we use uh, issue like instruction to put in, like we use this structure to identify and document the problems. That, that we can improve. And so yeah, this is the way that we are working on. And also another way is to turn this into a mind mapping um, diagram. So we can see those um, problems and what we can uh, improve in a more holistic way. So mind mapping and issue mapping structure. Yeah. Uh, of the 36 workshops that you've held so far, how many are there with the same participants or the same type of participants, the same places, and or the same issues in different places? Like, I'm just curious, how much are they are built on versus a completely new process from scratch, so to say? Um, in regards to the participants, um, usually they, they are now from, from different um, workshops because the topics are different. Oh, none of the same. So if I participated in your third workshop, I'm not participating in ten. You're usually one. not. Just one. Okay. Yeah. And even even that um, the ministries that um, are in charge of dealing that um, particular issue because there are 31 ministries and some of the project they, they may attend workshops for a few times. And even though um, there are also only a few uh, senior servants from that ministries have been participated in the workshop for more than two times. I mean, usually, so far as, as far as I remember, the apart from PO, because they, if, it, if they, um, the issues is related to their ministry, they have, usually have to come to the workshops. So, Usually, the civil servants who involve uh, in the workshop are POs, and then there are civil servants who are particularly working on that policy or service. They will come to the workshop, but even they are not usually coming here because uh, the government is such a big organization, not, and everyone is working on very specific things. Have you done any research with citizens who participate in these processes? Understanding afterwards, does it change their attitudes towards government or the democratic processes, or like how that kind of citizen level cultural change is happening? Yeah, so we, we did interview a few projects that we actually have solid outcomes, like either policy change, law change, or um, service change. And those participants, they find the process um, uh, really informative. And um, 
lots of them uh, give us feedback on the, the issue mapping process that they find it uh, interesting and also it, it allows them to have the opportunity to think and also reflect on different people's view. So they actually learn something from that process and they get a chance to cooperate possible services and solutions. But we didn't really speak to those people who are a little bit marginalized during the workshop. Like there are also people who are a little bit shy and they, they don't talk a lot and maybe they um, didn't participate enough, they're just watching and observing. We didn't really get a chance to get those people's feedback. And I think that's something that we can work on a little bit more as well. Is it, uh, maybe Audrey can also give uh, back on this side. Okay. <laughs> just a quick question and extension. Um, do you, at the introduction of these types of workshops, do you talk about any um, code of conduct, any very explicit, like, we want you to participate, we want you to be kind of neutral in your uh, yes. types of tone. Yes, I do. And I also explain the process and the tools that we use and why we're using those tools in the beginning of the workshop. Um, where can I get a copy of those? Is that in the slides? Um, yeah, I can, I can share the slides onto the hack folder later on. And any any difficulties that you find during the during the process? Is there anything that you particularly find uh, confusing, or any at any point where you feel like you need some support and clarification? Is anyone want to um, speak that anything of that? Yeah, so for me, I think the stakeholder map is a little confusing with the core direct and indirect. And just in our well, group of doing it, we, um, when we look at all the different stakeholders, I don't think we really understood what direct, indirect, and core meant at the beginning, but we figured that out later on. Just, I thought that was just slightly confusing. And how did you figure out? Uh, I think we decided to make our own uh, definition of what that meant. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Actually, it, it differs. So, um, it, it really depends on the group consensus. Some people would like to um, put those people who are going to um, like deliver the ideas in the core, so they are the core member of delivering the solutions. And some people do like to put the people who are going to be affected in the core as well. So it depends on who you want to put in the core. And then the stakeholders around it will build the direct and indirect. For, for me, the, the aspect that can where I see more area of opportunity is on the problem. And in my experience working with cities, people assume a lot of problems, uh, but they don't test if they are actual problems or not. So I like to take more like a hypothesis driven approach in which first we we do help and facilitate uh, the brainstorming of problems and then help with the distinction between symptoms, root causes, solutions discuss as problem, problems themselves, and then ask them to go back and look at the data and test if that's a real problem or not, if, uh, 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 and, and actually like share a story. Because sometimes we can get so lost into problems and it's like, okay, who's affected by this problem? Tell me their name, tell me their age, uh, tell me what implications do you think this problem has on their side, and then we open. Um, I guess that you do it all, uh, all together, but uh, 
Instagram. We do it only on the problem stage. Like, go talk to the people that have the problem and make sure your assumptions are real. So just kind of assumption checking and more hypothesis the driven problem solving. It's I don't know if it's, it's this something that you want on the second stage and not the research stage, yeah. but I would suggest Yeah, during the research stage, so during the preparation um, stage. Sorry, I should bring the exercise one as the guidance stage. So the actual preparation stage will be lots of interview on um, lots of interview with different stakeholders like experts. Um, the people who will be affected by the, the policy of services and we really get their view beforehand before we have the workshop so we do some communication before and it allows us to be more aware of what people will talk about during the workshop and also help us to identify the facts uh, really quickly. And also the literature review as well, to make sure that we have all, all of the facts, as, as many facts as we, we can have. Um, I think that the, the process was kind of amazing because at least for our group, there was just kind of total chaos for a period of time. And then eventually things kind of snapped into focus. And I think that was a really big learning moment for me that you know, sometimes you need to have patience with that process and uh, it's the role of the facilitator to kind of hold space for that ambiguity until things start making sense. Um, but at the same time, I wonder if there could be a slightly more structured onboarding process um, because I think at the beginning, you have this real tentativeness when the stakeholders don't necessarily know each other, don't know what everybody else's kind of stake is. Um, in the process, and what you tend to end up with in those situations, at least here, um, is that you know people who are naturally loud and talkative, like me, uh, will take over, <laughs> people who are you know more trying to like listen and, and make sense of things don't necessarily get a chance to express their thoughts. So I wonder if that could be more structured a little bit to frame that part of the, the messy process as that. Yeah, that's a really good suggestion. Thank you so much. To answer that question, you, you mentioned um, people who are shy don't necessarily come out as much. So like, what do you, especially in places, well, honestly, like the United States, where the loud people take over and the shy people just back away, what, what do you do to draw out the, the the sentiments of the people who naturally just back off. Yeah. So, so it's really important for the facilitators to to do some research about who is coming before um, the cooperation workshop, so they get a sense of who will be talking about what. It doesn't. It doesn't. We we don't often. Um, we don't usually get information from the citizens, particularly because some of them. Um, may not want to tell us about or what they're doing, their perspective, it depends on people. But in, in regards to the project that I mentioned earlier, when we go to the Hongkula Island of the southwest uh, of Taiwan, we reach those uh, fishermen and the fishermen of the associations. So that's another way that we get a chance of what they might be talking about during the workshop and give us more awareness. So it depends on if, if we really want to facilitate the discussion, I think a certain of preparation about the background of the participant is very, is very crucial. But we don't often, uh, we don't usually get a chance to, to do that. So uh, we can set up a slide of channel for people to input uh, anonymously or pseudonymously. Um, just while other people are talking on the microphone, they can just write arbitrary things and if it's a live stream, it also appear in a live stream. So in that regard, it's a very like in Taiwan, 
Uh, and around noon time, we also dedicate uh, a few, maybe 10 minutes or, or, or what, for the main facilitator to be me or Billy or Tom uh, to look through all the pseudonymous or anonymous uh, Slido comments and try to resolve it uh, within the mind map. But the problem is that because it's anonymous or pseudonymous, it's impossible to have a lot of interviews uh, with the shy people because we don't even know who they are. But on the other hand, uh, the fact that we don't know who they are uh, is safe for them because they don't have to review their identity to, to propose such um, comments. Um, What's your like internal training or like your problem when, when within your team you're like testing out an exercise or perhaps like training other people within your team? What's your process for how you kind of share your internal skill sets? Because what this is is kind of like a simulation of the practices that you do already, but like within your team, what kind of practices do you do? We think the exercises we also include uh, planning and simulation just after. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's really much similar to, to what we've done today. Okay, so I think it's the time to hand over the microphones to our two lovely VOs. And I would like to firstly invite uh, Tiffany to share about the our international website join. And if you have any questions, about BO's experience and, um, and and anything related to joy, you can also refer the um, question to Tiffany and her team.
So, uh, how can I get the story of the uh, participation? Let me uh, go to the uh, go back to the 2014. At that time, uh, the NDC ho hosted uh, the Economic and Transnational Affairs Conference. People suggested government should set up a website regarding to public policy issues by reference to the White House website, We the People. I think the people are very familiar with this platform. And uh, uh, people would like to uh, uh, act and request government uh, to establish the National Media Proposal Center. So after that, uh, the National Development Council launched the online participation in public policy. We call it join the GovTW. participation in public uh, policy, uh, we have three goals uh, we would like to achieve. First is to feedback from the city. Second is com uh, competent network entity and community multi-channels. And the third one is to how can we uh, to complete the process of governmental response. Okay, this is our uh, concept of online participation in public policies. Like a virtual circle of societies, we would like to listen to public opinions and encourage people's participation. And in terms of online interaction on the social media, we would like to integrate the most popular uh, social media, social networks to enhance interaction with people. So uh, in terms of user friendly interface and compatibility of different platforms, we would like to uh, try to uh, design a flexible way to design and then people can use any device, any mobile device, to access this platform. So, uh, and uh, we try to use the infographic and because it's easy to read and easy to access. So that's our uh, core concept of online participation in public policy. Uh, so, uh, on this slide, you can see the online participation in uh, public policy. We offer we offer our uh, citizens with uh, four kind of services, uh, which are proposals, consultation, department, directors, mailbox, and monitor projects. Because uh, today my time is limited, so I just want to focus on our top two, uh, which are proposals and consultation. And as you know, uh, well, we think the program is just kind of tools. We need to uh, make uh, regulations and so that the all agencies can follow our uh, requirements and can follow our uh, uh, concept to, uh, to implement, to implement uh, those things. So um, we um, make two directions, two directions. One is directions for implementing um, participation in public policies. And so, uh, you can see the, uh, the uh, proposals. Uh, proposals uh, include five procedures for uh, proposal identification, proposal submission, review, registration of support, and proposal uh, response. And, and in terms of uh, consultation on policy and draft laws and regulations, uh, we ask uh, uh, agencies when planning major policies or addressing uh, issues of social concern, the responsible authority may proactive, uh, proactively uh, use the participation platform to consult the general public and facilitate the focus uh, a discussion by the uh, general public. So, uh, in terms of um, administration, uh, as you are uh, concerned about the CIO's uh, role in this uh, in this uh, mechanism, so we ask a deputy head, spokes, uh, spokes, spoke person or a secretary general of the responsible authority is responsible for supervising matters related to these directions, and a responsible authority may form a working group for 
undertaking uh, the requirements of the public policy uh, online participation mechanism. And finally, the participation platform administrative authority should regularly compile a report of all uh, proposals and the status of policy consultation responses for the representation to the executive UN. Okay, every every information uh, on the uh, platform should be open on this uh, on this website. Okay, and the, uh, the other directions is about implementing the role of the participation officers in the executive plan and the subordinate agencies. I, I will skip this slide because I think Patricia will uh, introduce this uh, thing, so I will skip this slide. Okay, this is our board chart for making proposals and the registering uh, support. Uh, you can see this, uh, this board chart. There are uh, in total of five steps. Uh, to, uh, uh, to to make the proposals. First is about a uh, uh, proposer's identification, and the, the second step is proposal sub submission, and the third step is review by the NDC, and the fourth step is about a uh, 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 registration of support people, and finally is about an authority's response. So you can see these are our uh, uh, steps. Okay, I will elaborate all steps uh, on this slide. First, uh, first step, proposal. In terms of proposal identification, uh, a proposer may submit a proposal online only after the participation platform has conducted at one time authentication of the phone number and email address provided by the uh, proposer. Propo pro proposers. Okay, and the second step is uh, proposal submission. Uh, we, uh, we do not do everything because uh, we are executive uh, event. So the topics are limited to affairs and business related to the executive event and it's subordinated. So we do not deal with like uh, uh, political issues or uh, national, de uh, national defense issues because that's a uh, president's right. So uh, we don't touch those uh, business. And uh, the second is uh, the initiative can choose up to three authorities which should be responsible to the uh, petitions. Okay, and, and uh, uh, the review stage, uh, the participation platform administrative authorities, that's NDC, should conduct the review in accordance with the substance of a proposal when necessary, may invite the responsible authorities to assist the reviews, and as a rule, shall carry out the review of procedural within three working days. So we have a, a, a rush of time to do uh, the review. And the, uh, step four uh, is about the registration of support. All uh, persons processing citizenship of the state or holding a certificate of a permanent residency in the state may use a variety of accounts for logging onto the participation platform. And after a one-time authentication by means of mobile uh, mobile phone number, uh, register support for a proposal. To become established as a case requiring response, a proposal must, re uh, must receive 5,000 registrations of support within 60 days. Okay, and uh, let's go to the uh, step five. It's about the responses. Mm, the responsible author authorities of each proposal uh, should, pay should pay to opinions from all quarters and should access the visible of operating the proposal into policy implementation. The responsible uh, authorities should have a time period of two months for processing and uh, responding to an established proposal. And finally, uh, the formal uh, response and uh, explanation may be issued through a press conference or other means of information the general public. Information on the response should also be openly posted on the participation platform. This all the procedures, okay? Next, uh, uh, this slide I would like to uh, elaborate uh, uh, how the uh, responsible authorities will deal, deal with the established case. 
uh, you can see a, a, a special thing. Uh, when the day 14, uh, a, responsible, uh, a responsible agency will contact the proposal proposals to clarify the figures. We would like to understand this need. So we would, we would like to see the uh, proposal in person and to understand this need. Okay, so after uh, 60 days, uh, the government will produce a formal response. And uh, uh, I think there are four possible uh, consequences, uh, which are uh, taken into consideration uh, it may be partial accepted, or uh, uh, we will totally accept the idea, and sometimes we will dismiss these ideas. Okay? So there are four uh, possible consequences on the, uh, uh, on the response. Okay, uh, I will show you some uh, data about uh, uh, case scenario of proposals. Um, do you know, uh, there were uh, about uh, 5,700 proposals by the end of May 2018, and 2016-22 um, uh, were entered support registration procedures, and uh, 144 were established cases. The established rate was 5.5%. Uh, okay, so uh, and you can see the figures. Um, it's about uh, 51 cases have been taken into account, and uh, 31 cases have, have been partially accepted, and 48 uh, cases uh, have been dismissed. And uh, there are uh, 11 cases are uh, uh, under investigation. So uh, people are most uh, interested, um, uh, most uh, more interested in these areas, like education support and the transportation and infrastructures, health and the social security. These are, uh, e uh, these are issues people are more interested in. Okay, uh, now I would like to introduce some established case that uh, is very famous in Taiwan. First is uh, the act to amend the law of cancer uh, immunotherapy immuno immuno to the legislative legislat event by the end of December 2015. This is our first case, and it's kind of an accepted case because the uh, Ministry of Welfare and Health um, uh, made a law about, about the, they, they allow the cancer immunocyte therapy uh, into, the, into the law. So I think it's a very famous uh, case in Taiwan. And the other case, you can see uh, prohibition on the use of uh, disposal tableware throughout the country because we would like to uh, make our uh, make our uh, country more sustainable. So this uh, this are big issues in Taiwan. So uh, so I, I don't want to uh, explain every case, but you can see the the the, the proposals. Okay, workshop uh, as you know. Some uh, proposals are very complicated and very uh, across ministries, ministries. So my boss, Audrey, will coordinate, uh, coordinate the workshop collaboration and uh, make cooperation with other uh, ministries to produce a, a good, a good uh, response to our citizens. So you can see the, uh, uh, the pictures of the workshop. Okay, this is my point. I don't want to elaborate. Okay, and then I will introduce uh, the, the consultation. Uh, consultation on policy and draft laws and uh, regulations. Uh, we pro uh, provide three kinds of service on um, consultation, uh, which are policy consultation, draft law consultation, and draft regulation consultation. Okay. And uh, mm, uh, the establishment of government and citizen network participation and the dialogue mechanism during the policy formulation process, providing a network channel for uh, consulting various opinions before uh, the formation of department policy. And uh, in terms of draft regulation consultation, since 2017, 
the public notice uh, has been published in the pu public policy network participation platform to to gather opinions from the public on amendment on amendments to the draft orders. This is the uh, figures you can see on the uh, slide. So uh, this is the slide. Uh, on this slide, you can see uh, hot topics for discussion, uh, including like a, a comprehensive renewal of the multi card the unified national uh, identity card. In Taiwan, we are uh, doing to replace our new ID. But in the past, uh, our ID is printed his printed ID. We would like to uh, change printed ID to electronic ID. So some people think, can we uh, merge uh, electronic ID with our e-health card? So there are a lot of uh, discussion on this platform. And uh, in uh, Taiwan, we also concerned about the uh, homosexual people, a major life or major relationship in order to protect their rights and the legal status. So, uh, those issues are very hard, are very hard uh, in, uh, in Taiwan. So, uh, in order to understand the sophistication of online participation in public policies, NBC conducted a survey from uh, September to October of uh, 2017. Uh, you can see uh, uh, there are uh, 88, uh, 82. A point four of a respondents are very uh, are very satisfied with this platform, and uh, eighty two point two uh, percent of respondents are are willing to recommend this platform to others, and there are forty three point five respondents uh, uh, think the platform has a certain impact on the policy. Okay, and but 17.2% uh, uh, of respondents uh, think um, a little bit improved trust in the government. Okay, so we will do the certification uh, surveys uh, last year. So that's my uh, uh, brief introduction about our mechanism. Uh, anyway, I think we can uh, do this mechanism and make our government more open, more transparent, and more participation. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Audrey would like to answer your questions. So, so <laughs> Oh. I have more questions. 
Can you, you said some of the uh, proposals were rejected. Yeah. Can you say more about why and were they, was that accepted, the idea that they should be rejected? Uh, so they... some, some issues is about uh, political issues, like a uh, national yeah. defense. Or... Yes. So if it's a president's purview, uh, then it's not admitted. It, 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 it took us quite some time uh, to establish a boundary between the president's office, which is about the military and diplomacy, and cross-strait issues, quote unquote. Uh, and and we, we don't deal with that for this platform uh, now. And uh, actually, we changed the regulation to explicitly also rule out uh, things rooted in fantasy or science fiction because they are uh, keep to uh, people keep having petitions uh, for our Ministry of Foreign Affairs to establish uh, you know the Raelian movement to have a UFO embassy and things like that. And it, it's not strictly speaking, you know, the president's purview. It's actually constitutional, but <laughs> we don't actually think it's a very good use of people's time. Even though people keep citing the you know the deaths are. Um, petitioning the uh, real people uh, platform and say that we should have more humor, but uh, and in the end, we think it's better to say the public servants time by ruling out the uh, pure defection. Okay, please. Okay, please. Um, are there any examples of this tool or the, your office at the local level or at the municipal level within Taiwan? Yeah, great question. So um, the joint platform uh, currently is used by the administrative branch, also the corrective branch. This is a, a like in Taiwan's constitution, there's also a branch dedicated for auditing. And uh, they use this consultative platform to ask the people uh, of a certain city uh, that like the city government is doing something that they don't know how to audit, but instead of uh, calling a staff or pulling a break to do these things, they ask what people's doubt are around these new ways of doing things, and they collect those doubts and ask the uh, ministers in charge, something like me, if uh, it's about social enterprise, and then they establish new auditing uh, standards. So it's a kind of a win-win solution for everybody involved because it basically translates people's fears and doubts into new auditing mechanisms that enabled uh, the administration to go ahead with innovative ideas. Uh, and uh, as for cities and counties, at the moment, five uh, cities and counties. Uh, are in this platform as well, and usually just for proposals um, or um, consultations. But uh, for privacy, it's special because it's part of the I voting process. So the petitions on the Taipei portion of the joint platform actually gets put after a threshold into the I voting um, stage where it actually becomes binding uh, to the administration, but in the city government. But so far, at least Taipei City does that. And I think in a few months, we're also going to offer participatory budgeting uh, support for the city government so they can also use join as a common TV platform. So in, in that note, it's a lot like council uh, in, in Nigeria. And a follow up, do those same five cities offer some type of 311 or non emergency like public ticketing system? Yes, they do. Um, and also, well, I'm hesitant to say this with having these people in the room, but also another thing is um, before the federal government started working on this, a lot of the participatory work was being handled at local governments and it sort of grew up out of that. Are there examples of when elected officials at any level of government also participate in this as a way to engage with and discuss with citizens? Or is it primarily for citizens to interact with government? Like, I'm just trying to understand like, how to weigh some of the deliberations of it. Yeah, that's a fair question. Some, some MPs use this platform as a way to kind of test the water of how popular uh, their proposals are. Some parties use this as a testing ground before they bring it to the national referendum uh, platform. We see a lot of that dynamic this year now that we have a really binding national referendum uh, act. Um, so, so yes, it is being used to all sorts of political purposes. 
Um, what are the, or are there any, like, what, what are the amplification mechanisms used within the platform to kind of highlight things that people should be focusing on? Um, and is there kind of a email, SMS-based communication scheme, and is that done in kind of an automated dry way, or is it done in a, you know, fun, narrative way? Right, so there's a weekly digest uh, that I receive every week, because I subscribe to every petition and regulation category, so I receive this regular one. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is, is just me. Uh, and uh, actually, the NDCP will call, I think, um, almost a thousand NGOs and CSOs uh, in the country uh, that are registered as uh, interested in specific um, uh, areas, so that in a privacy and an informed consent way, uh, they think their address, email address is used after calling them and confirming uh, to automatically subscribe them to the bulletin of the petitions and regulation for announcements uh, that's related to the CSO's um, stated um, mission, and they get those um, letters for free. Uh, and also people who have participated in the petition uh, get those you know, Amazon style recommendations you may also be interested in. Uh, so uh, uh, petitioner regulation, that's I guess the, the more fun part. Uh, and also all the petitioners and country signature uh, people are uh, required to have an SMS number, mostly to avoid you know, people registering 5,000 emails. Uh, but uh, starting next month, I think, uh, both email and SMS are required so that we can send those letters uh, through email. And what what do you use to, I and mean, I guess the S SMS goes like a bit of the way, how do you make sure people are in Taiwan? Do you, do you, is that a concern that people are of any type of status? Yeah, if you're a if you're a resident, actually, um, you don't have to be um, with the, the, the you know a, a full citizenship. Uh, that's actually one of the key changes we did to the regulation. So this is unlike the referendum or the normal voting system where you have to have full citizenship. All we ask is that you're a, a resident that you're, you're staying here. And, and is that voluntarily enforced, or is that done through? Like, it is voluntarily enforced, yeah. but, but I guess. Um, you know, just during the, the time to obtain a SMS, I guess you can work around it variously using prepaid cards or, or whatever, but, but you do have to tick a checkbox that says you're a resident or a full citizen. What if you're a citizen but you're not a resident in Taiwan? <laughs> well, then you're eligible. Yeah. So it's like, you're either a citizen or a resident. Parts 
So we uh, became a golden triangle. And uh, we, I think we really create a new way, or uh, I'm not sure if I can uh, say it as a model, because it's a, a very new and young. So I just want to say we create a new way to serve our people. OK. Uh, sometimes I, I ask myself a question. What's the difference from the traditional way and the new way? Uh, let me borrow a uh, political system, a uh, political theory that David Eastern uh, he just did say. Um, political in a political process is a system, and uh, we learn more about this political the system theory that the uh, uh, officials doing is to design and uh, to excuse uh, execution of policies and to evaluate the, the, the effectiveness or what it is, uh, is that efficiently, uh, if efficiently or not. But you know, uh, there is a left uh, big part about the system is a uh, black box. Some people always say the uh, process of uh, policy is like a big black box that no uh, transparency that uh, people outside the policy uh, we don't know what happened in this black box. So uh, I think the main contribution that the old network doing is to take up the top cover of black box for political system. And uh, what the PO is doing is uh, we use new technologies, tools, and a new skill to uh, bring multi stakeholders together and then to develop solutions or improve. Um, we do is uh, propose online, people propose online, and uh, set an emotion online. And uh, we made a, a collaboration meeting face to face to get uh, uh, different interests together. And uh, uh, according to the join a plan, uh, we use the new new tools, uh, just like the join a platform and uh, slido.com, or uh, we broadcast the, the live show with uh, the collaborative meeting, uh, live stream, and uh, I think uh, collaborative relation means make it more transparency. Okay, uh, the other question comes, uh, what makes us become a PO? Uh, many friends or co-workers uh, always ask, him, ask me uh, how to become a PO or what kind of personality or capability makes you become a PO. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer this question properly but uh, I want to say something uh, uh, just one time. I, I think about even uh, low level civil servants has his or her dream to achieve. That is to improve the quality of policies and make the, all stakeholders be more happy. Let's, uh, I think sometimes people say, when you become a senior public servant, you will lose your passion and uh, uh, the work is daily like nothing new. But um, I think to be a PO is a new opportunity to review yourself and uh, to check out um, how many passion you have and uh, you may contribute it to other people. And our job is, um, as Tiffany mentioned before, uh, we check joint e platform every day to collect established cases to resolve. And uh, 
uh, we open meaning information and records online. That's what we have to do. And uh, we uh, join the collaboration meetings uh, led by PDs or by our own. Sometimes uh, some, uh, some issues uh, didn't enter the PDs pick the, to uh, open a collaboration meeting. So uh, we make it ourselves in, inside our ministries. And uh, we integrate the inside and the outside units actions of the ministry. This is the um, most complicated part of our jobs. Because um, in different ministries, some PO thinks uh, they are doing um, meaningful jobs and uh, some PO sometimes think uh, they do their jobs uh, in very tough situation. Uh, that's different. Why? Because, uh, why? Because of the empowerment or uh, delegation is in a different uh, degree or situation. So, but I think I'm so lucky that uh, my boss is uh, give me totally trust. Okay. On the PO network, we have the structure and the hierarchy. Uh, first level uh, is the executive run PO board, I call it, uh, lead by uh, Audrey. And uh, the second level, we call the ministry level. Mm, just as uh, so Tiffany said, we have uh, 31 ministry and the draft uh, almost uh, over six. Six PO, and uh, now we are encouraged to create our own uh, PO system under our ministry. So, um, in my, I'm lucky to have uh, my boss's support, and uh, we just uh, pass uh, to pu just publish um, administrative rule as the legal basis, legal basis bit, uh, yeah, of our works. Mm, in the e platform that joined, um, so many people concerns about the agriculture questions. But what is the FAQ in agricultural field on joint? Um, let me tell you. The first place is about the, the food safety, especially Taiwan is highly concerned about the limitation or the regulation of a pesticide and to use on the vegetables or uh, animal products. So it's like that. And uh, this kind of uh, issues almost uh, uh, related to the uh, Ministry of Health and Welfare. So if uh, this, this kind of issue comes out and uh, we always have collaboration meetings with uh, uh, with the Ministry of Health and Welfare. And uh, the second place is the struggle between industrial development and environment protection. Uh, this place I I use the industries uh, not means the industry. You know what I mean is about uh, uh, farmers or the fishermen this kind of industry. Uh, the Penghu case uh, we, we mentioned earlier is about the fishermen's, uh, their right to fishery, and uh, between the, uh, the proposer is uh, several diving lovers, but they are also the warrior about environmental protection. So uh, they make this proposal by goodwill, but the, it makes the fishermen's community feel um, anxious or nervous, or worry about their their life or their living is uh, is to be harmed. So it's a special case. And the third place is about the animal protection. 
Uh, it's very interesting that uh, animal protection is uh, a new booming issue in Taiwan. Mm, we know the there are a community with members not too many, but they speak louder and in the internet. So mm, they are so solid, and they can make proposal. Uh, one didn't didn't uh, pass the review, and uh, the second one is coming following so close. So we always uh, deal with the animal protection issues. And the fourth, uh, fourth place is the disease control via animal rights. Uh, air flu is a very severe problem in Taiwan. So it is, uh, oh, we always stay in that kind of uh, issues in joint play before. Okay, this is the Peng Hu case. I think I don't want to waste too much time to explain it, but uh, I want to share uh, to separate the rival, rival teams, I think. I don't know how to put it, but I just use this term that uh, we set two rooms, one for collaborating meeting, and then the other room playing the live stream for online participants and people which came to show their high concern. And um, I'm so glad that Audrey uh, with us in the second room and uh, to let fun to host uh, collaborating meetings. Uh, the multi step Holders came together, including public sectors, and the local government, fishermen's association, and hundreds of residents and some local councillors. Um, they are just the people who protest because they're trying to play some roles. Uh, that's Taiwan's democracy. Okay. Uh, last uh, slide. I want to share about the challenges we met. Mm, we found that when the proposals are clear and the stakeholders are comfortable, it will be easier. But however, the reality is always more complicated. Sometimes uh, we have to make some pre-meetings to clarify uh, what's the real core problem. Because sometimes uh, uh, there will be some noisy signal in the in the proposals. Uh, you cannot clarify that. And the second is to transform the organization culture is quite a tough mission. To accept uh, to extend new methods requires more efforts. Uh, because um, in the civil servant system, uh, people has the uh, habit or his way to doing things. So, uh, especially the young generation can learn the new technology or new skill quickly, but the senior or the elders one, um, they just don't like to or not use the to-do list. So, uh, I will organize some training and uh, to uh, asking for the help from the police. And uh, the third is um, people has, have to urge themselves all the time not to open the existing comment chain inside the government. The empowerment is very important. Because um, sometimes we, uh, we have to host some uh, discussion or pre-meeting, but it will open the ex existing comment system, you know. When we deal with um, animal protection issue, you know, I'm the director of uh, the uh, secretariat. Uh, my daily work is about the uh, liaison 
to media and the Congress that the animal protection or uh, livestock is not my expertise. So we to deal with these uh, issues, we have to invite the people who in charge with this problem. Let's the uh, let the unit about uh, this part. And uh, if we discuss together, uh, who will listen to or who's the boss? It is a finally a little bit. Um, how to put it, um, a little bit uh, mm. delicate. Huh? Delicate? Yeah, really mm -hmm. delicate. So, you know, uh, they sometimes, uh, or always, uh, don't like to create a new battlefield, and uh, they will always hope you uh, just go through and uh, close the case, uh, everything uh, is okay and everybody is happy. But the value of PO Network is to push our inside, uh, the, uh, our insiders to face the real case that we have to, and we have the responsibility to solve. So I can let that let, let, let happen. So sometimes the, we have to work together, but uh, I have to urge the, uh, ourselves not to offend them. And uh, for the, uh, not every collaborating collaboration meeting will lead to change of rules. But sometimes um, in a happy ending, we don't have to uh, go into the lawmaking. Maybe we just modify our uh, executive process. It's okay. Can cause a good, uh, a good end. But sometimes we have to uh, relocation, relocating some resources to modify or to fix the problem. And sometimes we have to uh, launch the lawmaking process. It's different. But uh, but always that um, it is still I want to say means a lot about improving mutual understanding about among the people with different interests. Uh, last thing I want to share is um, uh, in my opinion maybe our ultimate goal is uh, someday we there is no more people because. Uh, Every single public servant should have capabilities to internalize the value and the spirits of PO's role. So, that's all I want to share with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Can we get another round of applause for our Um, okay, so we are uh, going to wrap up now. Um, there is a list of resources over there. Uh, the main one is Hack Folder that we have been talking about uh, throughout the evening today. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like here. Um, Uh, so Hack Folder is a, is a new tool that's been built uh, by Dubzero, and it's an easy way to like, share links. So um, all the links, collaborative notes, timetables, all the slides, everything is there under that URL. We'll email all of this out to the folks that have registered, so you'll get it. And we're also going to be emailing you two feedback forms for both days. If you just fill out the ones for the ones that correspond to you. Um, in the interest of time, we wanted to take a really quick group photo, if that's okay. And then I'm going to pass this to Devin, who has one more announcement for everyone. Oh, only one more announcement. So after this event, we are going to have a reception. It's uh, 
Well, maybe 100 plus people have RSVP at this point. It's going to be a big deal. It's going to be taking place in this fabulously modularized space. So we're going to need volunteers between the hours of whenever this ends and the beginning of the reception that was advertised at 6.30 to help explore the implications of these crates, these doors being movable, and how things can get cleaned quickly and enthusiastically. So, after this picture, which is going to be a lot of fun, uh, you can come and see me, and I will test you, or like you will co, you will peer test each other, uh, in coming up with some methods to yes, clear all this, make this prepared for a presentation that's actually going to take place. I think it's seven, and then end the reception and the presentation. The audience have a presentation. will be kind of a bit of a. Um, overview for the new people who are going to be showing up so they understand what, what we went through over the last two days, the fabulous experience that took place. Um, and then, yes, and there will be drinks during that period of time as well into the evening. So, I'm here, I'm wearing my red. So, the things that you can do to super help us, clear your stuff off the tables, please, as quickly as possible, and if folks want to help take tables, we can take them down those stairs, and that would be amazing, and lay out chairs. That would be... Oh, but first, safety, excuse me, tables upstairs. But first, if we can get everyone up here for a quick group photo. Tina, please.
this will have to do. Uh, I'm going to push the button and then we'll, we can count backwards from 10 together. Yeah. <laughs> right? Button push. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. 